Good evening and welcome to Piers Morgan Uncensored with me, Rosanna Lockwood, back in the chair tonight for Piers. Now, spies, they walk among us. Always have done, always will. Part of the bargain is understanding that we have our own British spies walking elsewhere too. And the other part is staying on top of the threat, the classic game of cat and mouse. It is down to our intelligence services to make sure they spot the spies operating here and prevent their activities from tipping over into real world danger as much as they can. We're of course talking about here MI5, MI6, GCHQ and counter-terrorism police. And that's why this evening I tip my hat to all those involved in the investigation and detention of three suspected spies in the UK alleged to be working for the Russian security services. Now, these suspects are allegedly Bulgarian nationals. They've lived and worked here in the UK for many years. They were actually detained back in February, along with another two suspects. Investigations like these necessarily take place beyond our view. Sometimes the whole criminal trial process actually happens in secret behind closed doors due to national reasons of security. It's the Official Secrets Act. In my mind, that's an arrangement worth having in a country like ours that has been host to some really, truly horrendous Russian intelligence operations that go back to the height of the Cold War. Let's remind ourselves, in the 1950s and 1960s, a number of British nationals worked undercover for the Soviets. The most infamous was the Portland Five, who were later uncovered by MI5. Their 90 Soviet diplomats were expelled from the UK in 1971 after they were accused of spying for the Kremlin. In recent times, 2006, former Russian spy Alexander Litvinenko, a fierce critic of Vladimir Putin, was murdered after his cup of tea was laced with a radioactive substance. And in 2018, just a few years ago, former Russian double agent Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia were poisoned by the nerve agent Novichok in Salisbury. Now, on those most recent occasions, fresh in our minds, it felt a little bit like we weren't ahead of the threat that it's got to the point of Russian operatives carrying out lethal poisonings on our streets. But today's revelation about these suspects, for whatever reason revealed to us now, even though they've been detained for six months at this point, it does seem to confirm there's more going on behind the scenes than we necessarily realize. And that our authorities, they're not asleep at the wheel. And in a world filled with continuous threats from bad, murderous actors like Vladimir Putin, that's something I like to be reminded of. Now, joining us to discuss all of this is the American investor and arch critic of Vladimir Putin, Bill Browder, and former MI5 intelligence officer and whistleblower, Annie Machon. Great to have you both with us. Um, Bill, I will come to you first. Um, you've made it your latter life's work speaking out against the Kremlin, the bad actions of the Kremlin, murderous actions at this point. Um, tell us your reaction to the news today. Well, um, my, my first reaction is if they've caught three, there's probably 150 that they haven't caught. I mean, the Russians have a very, very active intelligence gathering operation uh, in the UK. Um, in addition to the official people who are uh, in the embassy, there are these unofficials like these characters that have been uh, arrested or, or arrested back in February. Um, uh, the, the other thing I would say is, is that it's not just these people that are doing Putin's dirty work in the UK. Um, I've been a victim myself of Russian oligarchs who were asked by Putin to do things. Um, those oligarchs then hire British lawyers, British private investigators, British PR firms to carry out the Kremlin's wishes. Um, when, you, when you say we haven't been asleep at the wheel because we caught these people, we, we, these people have been active in the UK for 10 years. And I believe that that a big reason why um, all these uh, things are, are happening is because there's so much mo Russian money flowing into the UK that nobody really wanted to say say a, a word otherwise. And, and that's why we're in this situation. Yeah, I mean, you bring up the important point that there are actors that are hiding, uh, that our intelligence uh, agencies are looking for and spotting. I said that they did well in this case, you disagree with me, but also those who hide in plain sight. And this is the very relevant point of Russian interference, Russian funding, Russian money that comes into the United Kingdom, specifically London as well. I know this is a point that you are particularly concerned about because it's often the people that we're looking at day to day. It's newspaper owners, it's people in the House of Lords. It's, it's everywhere. The scale of Russian influence in the United Kingdom is something quite shocking. And do you think that has changed at all since the onset of what I'm going to call the renewed invasion of Ukraine? Indeed, there's no there's no question that that the, um, the the whole mood has changed in the UK 
since February 2022, when, when this terrible, murderous war has started. Uh, things are completely different now than they were before. But the trouble is that the, they had, the Russians had like um, 20 years to get their claws into us. And they're, they're everywhere. I mean, and just you mentioned uh, the House of Lords. Um, Alexander Lebedev, who was a former KGB agent, who became extremely wealthy from his contacts in the Russian government, um, his son came to the UK, spending his money to buy a newspaper. He naturalized, and then he became a member of the House of Lords. I mean, you have a direct hereditary connection to the Russian security services in the House of Lords. It doesn't get much more uh, clearer than that. I mean, that's that, that's right out in the open, right there for us, all of us to see, and nobody said a word about it. It's pretty plain sight, isn't it, Bill? Look, I want to talk a little bit about your experience as well with living alongside these threats, because you have taken on the Kremlin very forthrightly. You say there have been threats to your life. Just talk to us a little bit about that, what that feels like day to day. Well, my, my, my main goal has been to get um, the Russian government officials connected to Putin Ha, uh, sanctioned, have their assets frozen and their visas canceled under something called the Magnitsky Act. Putin hates my guts for the Magnitsky Act. It's now been passed in the UK and 34 other countries. And he's been going after me with death threats, kidnapping threats, aid Interpol arrest warrants, lawsuits, all sorts of other stuff. And there's all sorts of people involved in all these things in the West being paid for by the Russians. And so I'm constantly um, having to effectively look over my shoulders, not just for Russians, but for Western enablers who have been hired by the Russians to be um, working for Putin. It's very ugly. It is very ugly, and that's something I just want to uh, discuss to you before we go across to Annie to get a bit of the intelligence officer side of things. But in terms of the ugliness of it, Bill, it's something I, I'm also keen to remind people of, viewers to this program, colleagues and everything else, that sometimes when it comes to spy stories, people get a bit caught up and think, oh, it's terribly sexy and interesting, because obviously we know what Hollywood does with spy stories. But the real reality of it, like we saw in Salisbury, is very grim indeed, isn't it? It is grim indeed. And, and um, it's not just Salisbury. We've seen poisonings taking place all over Europe. Um, we, of course, there was the... Uh, Litvinenko that you mentioned in the introduction where with uh, polonium 210 and and there are people all over um, enemies of Putin who have been poisoned um, shot um, in all sorts of other situations by people agents working for the Russian government um, this is not just some kind of like high level stuff uh, this is you know on the street you know life and death type of stuff and and it, it puts everybody at risk and it's something which absolutely have to be exposed and stopped. Bill, thank you. Let's cross over to Annie now. Annie, you and I have spoken in the past, I think, in different settings and different occasions. And I want to remind viewers that you were a former MI5 intelligence officer. You've turned almost a whistleblower now, I think it's fair to say. You've talked more about the agency and the type of operations that they carry out. So when you saw this news today, perhaps you saw it before we did or you knew about it before, uh, what did you think about it? Do you think um, it, we're receiving the information exactly as it is? Um, I have to say I was slightly flummoxed when I first read the story because these people sound so low down the pecking order. Um, I was thinking, well, what sort of access would they have? But um, Bill alluded to this before very briefly in the sense there is a sort of hierarchy when it comes to intelligence work. So um, in terms of the intelligence officers who work for organisations like the FSB and the SVR, they would come into the UK under diplomatic cover, be based in somewhere like the embassy or perhaps a trade delegation. And they are the intelligence officers trying to gather um, secrets from the UK um, and sending them back to Russia. In terms of the people who uh, were arrested and alleged to have been in possession of um, interesting documents, these would be termed illegals. So, you know, you mentioned a couple of the old spy rings in UK history. They tend to be people who are placed in the local community. They may be undercover for years and then activated when needed. Or indeed, they may not have been, um, allegedly, may not have been part of aspiring, but became active much more recently. But illegals don't have diplomatic immunity like the intelligence officers do, who are based out of the um, embassy. So they can be prosecuted. And I think that's what's happened in this case. I mean, just to go back to more recent UK history as well, when it comes to other illegals, in 1998, a woman called Melita Norwood, who became known in the media as the granny spy, I don't know if you remember this case, was outed as someone who had passed the national security secrets to the Russians for decades. Mm. And more recently, but in the U US, there was, of course, the American um, spy ring 
in 2010, of whom um, one of the members was someone who became known as the Glamorous Spy, Anna Chapman. And they were illegals, they could have been prosecuted, but they were involved in a spy swap and sent back to Russia. So this thing, you know, these sort of approaches do go on fairly routinely. And even though the access, the apparent access of these three um, suspects, um, they haven't yet been uh, convicted, obviously, they're innocent until proven guilty. Um, but the access of these three suspects perhaps is less relevant than the fact that they happen to be EU nationals, so freedom of movement before Brexit. And also they could have just been part of a sort of um, an undercover cell that provided um, low-level support to others who were more active within the intelligence. Thanks, Annie. I think our viewers will be interested to know, and not, I'm stressing not in specific relation to this case and these suspects, again, ongoing case, uh, innocent until mm -hmm. pro proven guilty, but some of the previous examples you've highlighted as well, why people choose to go and work for other governments. Obviously, Bulgaria and Russia have a long Soviet history behind them, but you say that these people don't have the diplomatic immunity afforded to people who might be in the diploma diplomatic residence of their country. It's enormously risky. What leads people? Mm -hmm. I know there's not one set answer, but to do this? It's a very complex answer. Um, in terms of trying to recruit agents in the field, um, most intelligence officers use an acronym which is MICE. So that means um, how to motivate someone to do precisely what we're discussing here, which is take a huge risk and potentially betray um, people, family, friends that they might work with. So MICE stands for money, ideology, compromise and ego. Um, and in most cases, the most willing agents and illegals would be the most willing people because they volunteer to go and do this sort of thing, would probably not be hugely motivated by money, although that will help. Um, probably not compromise because, you know, they make very unwilling um, employees. But ego, certainly, the idea that you're working in the shadows, you're doing something secret, you um, are potentially doing something that's good for your country's longer term interests, or you might have relatives in, who are Russian. Um, so you're doing something in the interest you think of Russia. So that would be the ideological side of things. So I think with the legals, generally, you appeal to the ego and you appeal to the ideological function. And then obviously there's a sort of financial incentive thrown in on top of that. So that would be how these people could be recruited and sent in. But to live a very secret life um, for 10 years and a fairly humdrum one as well. You mentioned in your mm -hmm. intro that, you know, spies are always glamorized in the media and they are. But um, a lot of these sort of undercover spirings, the illegals, live very humdrum looking lives, as these three apparently did, um, in the suburbs, doing routine jobs. But, you know, by night, they're doing a very secret job, a very secret role. So it's a, it's a weird combination. It certainly is, but it is absolutely fascinating. Getting your expertise and specialism on this, Annie and Bill, thank you very much for joining us.